Hope you're all sitting comfortably. I am. I don't normally sit comfortably. Yeah. Um, sorry, this is a totally random comment, but it's just a thought that came through my mind as Joel was talking. Nothing in my notes. But um, the cost of living crisis is an interesting one, isn't it? Um, I mean, you might not say that's a very good word to use. Actually, interesting isn't necessarily what we're thinking, but um, it's challenging, isn't it? It's challenging us. We're all challenged. We're all thinking, oh, goodness me, how am I going to pay my bills? Prices are going up. For some people, it's far more challenging than others. Do you know what? It's a little window into how the majority of the world live all the time. All the time, the majority of the world don't have choices that we have. You know, they don't have the choices about holidays, about a new TV, or whatever. Do you know what I mean? The things that maybe we think, oh, I have to put that on hold, or maybe I'll have to scale back that. Actually, most of the world, they live hand to mouth. So, just talk about the nations. I had that thought. Anyway, it's nothing to do with what I really want to say. Um, so, uh, there's no slides. Um, I got some headings, though. And I've called this a change of focus. Um, so, and I just want to explain the journey that I've been on uh, before we get to some more practicalities. But, but some of you will recall that in the autumn of 2019, I took a sabbatical. I was away for three months um, doing various things. Um, but one of the things was that I just wanted to think about my gift mix. That might sound a strange thing, a sort of thing a leader does, isn't it, really? A leader thing, well, my gift mix. I just, I just knew that God had given me certain things that I, I enjoyed doing, things that were fruitful, things that other people acknowledged in my life. But I just wanted to kind of get some clarity for myself, uh, and so I wanted to think about that. And so overarching everything of that sabbatical was probably this sense of, a kind of it's, it's an identity thing and to some extent, you know, what has God gifted me with um, uh, in terms of uh, my kind of ministry. But alongside that, I read a book called The Making of a Leader by Dr. Robert Clinton. The name obviously always tickles me because we know our friend Clinton. So when I refer to Dr. Clinton, I'm not referring to Clinton Corrin uh, in, uh, down the road. It's, it's the author of this book. Um, and um, the book explains the different stages of ministry development in a leader's life of how God works in each stage, whether it's from a young start, through the many years, right through kind of to retirement, really. I have to say, it's probably the most helpful Christian book I've ever read. I absolutely loved it. I lapped it up. It, it was brilliant. And what it meant is I looked back over my Christian life, many events began to make sense. I thought, oh, that's why that happened. He explains things. He explains different the way God interacts, the way God isolates you from ministry for periods of time, all sorts of things. Oh, that's why that happened. Oh, that's what God is doing there. And then as I look forward, I was drawn to what Dr. Clinton calls this thing called convergence. Don't worry about the word, um, but it's a phrase of ministry. And he describes the phrase of the, uh, as this. It's where God moves the leader into a role that matches his gift mix and experience so that ministry is maximized. The leader uses the best he has to offer and is freed from ministry for which he is not gifted or suited. And in the margin of the book, I just wrote, yes, that's what I want. I looked back, and as I read it, I thought, that is what I want. That is where I'm heading. That is what I want to get hold of. And uh, I could speak for, you know, all the way till I get beamed up, I could speak on that, but I, I won't. Um, I'll say that for another day. Um, so I felt God speak to me about my future, a shifting away, pardon the phrase if it's the wrong phrase, a shifting away from general eldership to a more specific ministry. It's the best way I could phrase it. Uh, focusing on the gifts that God has given me. And so as I came out of the sabbatical in early 2020, I had a strong desire to become more focused, uh, but I wasn't sure what that looked like. But then, of course, we know what happened, don't we? 2020, remember that fateful year? We had a pandemic. And suddenly, do you know, we got, I, I won't go into that either. No, sorry, I'm living. We, I got very close to making some announcements to the church, which just as well I didn't because they changed. My plans changed um, just as well. But, but it's like in my mind, lots of changes going around and suddenly I'm hit with this pandemic. Oh, what do we do now? You know, we've got to figure out how to do church online and all that. So, and of course, we did have our own leadership challenges as well. So it's important that I stayed focused, stayed in my role, uh, put aside this idea of convergence for a while. That wasn't the season for it, clearly. 
But we have now moved into a different season. We have Joel here established in his leadership, and he's in his second year now, and uh, he's been doing an amazing job. Absolutely. So I think the time is right to start focusing more specifically on what God has called me to do. So that's, that's the build-up. That's how I got there. So what does the future look like? What am I talking about? What does this new normal mean for me? So ever since I took a team to Albania in 2010, I found a kind of an emerging prophetic gift in me. Um, and I've been on an exciting journey, to be honest, regarding that. And among the many different gifts that I believe God's given me, because obviously sabbatical was looking at across the gifting, um, I think the prophetic is the dominant gift I have. And so everything I do or say, even the wor- how I see the world, has a prophetic edge running through it. I just see the prophetic everywhere. And in our regions beyond movement, um, this has been recognised by apostles such as Steve Oliver and Fousey, who you, who you know. And so in the sabbatical, I just wanted to develop a clearer definition of this prophetic gift. How do I define it? Because I could see certain like prophetic ministry, and if you know like, names like Julian Adams or what have you, I could see certain, and I thought, but I'm not like him. I'm not like that. And, and the danger is, well, therefore I'm not that. But actually, um, there's many, many different types of prophetic ministry. Just like there are different types of apostles, different types of evangelists. We don't all fit into the one mold, and that's really important. And that's to do with the gift mix. It's to do with all the gifts that make it up. And so I landed on two phrases that I think sum up the gift that God has given me. I'm open to changing this, but this is where I've landed at the moment. Two phrases. First one is a teaching prophet. Um, And those of you that know me well know that I'm really keen to develop a good theology in the prophetic. I don't want some of this wishy-washy nonsense, if I can phrase it like that. I want to be grounded in scripture, grounded in truth, but believing the wonder of the prophetic. And, 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 you know, and sometimes it is kind of like, whoa, that's quite a crazy, unexplained moment. But as long as it's grounded in truth, we're on safe ground. But the second phrase is this. It's called a prophet to the nations, which does sound a little bit like I'm bigging myself up, but actually it was a statement that somebody spoke over me. I can remember her now saying, Rodney, you're a prophet to the nations. I can remember it. I know where it was. I know when it was. I can picture it. And you know what? Over the years, that's proved to be relevant and fruitful. And so it's a phrase that I've chosen to adopt. It wasn't my phrase. It was spoken over me. I feel that's right. So those two things, I think, sum up the prophetic ministry. And then increasingly, in regions beyond, I find requests coming from overseas Uh, and from UK churches as well. I'm getting invited to work into different teams, again, both in the UK, but also in terms of the globally, the the regions beyond team. I'm getting, I'm out again to be with them in Dubai in in October. So I'm getting drawn into these these bigger settings. Um, And I'm partnering with Fousey. We're trying to explore what an apostolic prophetic partnership looks like. Again, something we believe is clearly in scripture. Um, and we're just trying to figure out what does that look like. But there are other things that God is wanting me to focus on as well in this next season. I just want to share one of them. And one of these is actually fathering younger leaders. This is what Paul writes, uh, 1 Corinthians 4, 15. If you were to have countless tutors in Christ, yet you would not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. And ever since I went to Albania, actually, I've noticed how many young leaders don't have fathers. And it worries me. And they need fathers. They desperately need fathers. Um, There are lots of people and there are books that will tell leaders what to do. There's lots of people that will be tutors and books are particularly tutors, how to grow your church. But you know, fathering's different. A father loves. A father supports. A father feels. A father is there. It's about relationship. A father will encourage, but also challenge, while deeply caring about the leader. And this is something I feel God is drawing me into. As as I've grown older and the years roll by, I feel more and more God calls me to father younger leaders. So those are some of the some of the things that it's going to look like. So now, finally, the practicalities. Okay. So what is the plan? How's this going to work out? 
obviously Joel and I and Pete have been chatting, so don't worry. Uh, this won't take Joel by surprise. Um, so the plan is that from the first, from the first of January, um, from the first of January, I'm going down to two days a week working for Redeemer. Okay, so not just yet. We've got a few months. It's the first of January, but um, hopefully you'll be pleased about this. I remain an elder here in the church. I continue to preach, and I will be around for over fifty percent of the Sundays. So I will be around, and I'll be very much. Locked in. I will be totally committed, continuing to be totally committed to Redeemer, to our success together. This is my home church, and this is where I am most investing anything into is the church here. But of course, sadly, my salary will drop to reflect uh, the reduced hours. So some cheers there. Oh dear. Yeah, should have said a little bit of sad faces. No, you should have should be some no, no, of course not. God forbid. Anyway, okay, so then that, that, so that's two days a week. Then for three days a week, and you've got to understand, this is not like a two days this week right now onto three days this week. This, this, this is a, like over the course of a year, this is how the percentages work out. It has to be more like that rather than a defined two jobs kind of scenario where I've been in that before. That's quite tricky. So for three days a week, I will be what I'm calling itinerant with a focus on developing a wider prophetic ministry, which is what I've talked about, and serving churches and teams within the UK and overseas. And so I thought, well, I need a way to fund these three days a week, and I need a way to make them accountable, make me accountable, rather, uh, within this time, so that I'm not, you know, just for the three days a week, I'm not just doing the garden or something. Um, Tempting, though, that is. So... Originally, I thought I might set up a charity and, and, and with the help of payment, uh, I did look into that a little bit. But actually, um, given the nature of what I was doing, I was advised against that by uh, a, an organization called Stewardship Services. Now, you may or may not have heard of Stewardship Services. They really impact us as a church quite a lot. They have a lot of help. We, they help us a lot, is what I should say. Stewardship Services, they are the Christian charity experts that most churches use for information, for setting things up, for structure, and, they, and, and you subscribe to them and they send out newsletters and information and you can use their services, and we've been using them for some years, and I, I, most churches, I think, in the UK use them. So I was in contact with Stewardship Service, and they said, actually, we don't think a charity is the right way forward for what you are suggesting, and they suggested something different which one of you may have heard of. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be partnering with stewardship with what they call an individual partner account. So in other words, what they do is they promote, help to promote and facilitate individual ministries, Christian ministries. And they're, they're, they're quite specialist at doing that. Kind of like one-man bands in a way. Um, and so what they'll do is they'll work with me uh, to produce a financial plan and then they'll handle the finance. So any giving will go to stewardship, and then they will pass back to me, having taken their cut, (laughs) but also having um, sorted out any gift aid or anything else that needs to be sorted out. And so I'm going to be looking towards the end of this year for sponsorship, both from individuals and from churches. And, um, And so... As well as stewardship, where there's a little bit of accountability in there, my accountability will also be to the Redeemer elders, um, who I want to, you know, I'll be accountable, I'm part of the team anyway, so it seems the obvious place to keep um, the main part of accountability. But there'll also be other accountability in regions beyond, particularly people like Fousey, uh, and maybe one or two people on the UK team. But I want to stress that any fundraising is not primarily about redeeming lost salary, um, Do you know what? There are lots of expenses in serving churches, particularly when you're going overseas. Um, And many of the places I go to, they're third world places. And so there is absolutely no way in the world they can afford for me to fly out there. They they couldn't even afford to put me on a boat. Not that I'd want to spend three months trying to get over to wherever. Um, So um, I need a mechanism and a way of getting to these places. Often when I'm there, sometimes they can look after me. Um, They have got homes they can put me in, and sometimes I still need some some accommodation. 
Um, and so, therefore, a lot of it is to do with um, really getting me to the nations uh, where I feel God is calling me, where I feel Steve Oliver has asked me to get more involved in the nations. Fousey wants me to get more involved in his world. I'm being pulled all the time, and I'm just now trying to find a mechanism that will do that. So, this change, it raises lots of questions, and I want you to think about questions. It raises questions about finance in us, in our church. It raises questions about the staffing in our church. It raises questions maybe about future eldership and things like that in our church. I want you to think about those questions and other questions over the next couple of weeks and then bring those questions to the family night in two weeks' time. And we'll be talking more about this, but we can particularly answer your questions and talk more about what the impact of this change is in the new year in Redeemer. Okay, that's my bit. Back to Joel.